was a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse Where they've seen me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church Trying to walk on my own but I'm wound up lost Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross not a trophy for the winners it's a shelter for the sinners and it's right where i belong take me back to the place that feels like home to the people i can depend on to the faith that's in my bones take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst to the love i have I want to go to church I want to go to church that's in my bones take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst to the love I had at first oh I want to go to church yeah I want to go to church oh I want to go Are you glad you're in church? Let's all stand and sing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues. Come on now, sing it. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Come on now. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Are you glad today? Are you glad that you know the Lord? Let's honor him today. Come on now. I will enter his gates. Sing it out. Here we go. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, his love 
endures forever and his faithfulness continues. Sing it out for the honor and glory of God. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made. He has made me glad, oh he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad, he has made me glad, oh he has made me glad, I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice, yeah. I will rejoice, yeah. I will rejoice, yeah. I will rejoice, yeah. Are you glad to be here today? Praise the Lord. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. I can't think of any place I'd rather be than right here with God's people, Bible Baptist Church, getting ready for an old-fashioned revival meeting. Yes. And we've got the preacher who's going to lay it all on. He's not going to leave anything on the field. He's going to lay it all on the line, and we're looking forward to that this week, trusting God for a great, great week. Father, I pray that you might bless this week of revival. We pray that it truly will be revival. Revive our hearts, Father. We need, we need we need to have listening ears. We need to have open hearts. Lord, help me to have listening ears and an open heart. Help the people here to have listening ears and an open heart. God, meet with us in a special way. I pray that you'll do something in my life, in the life of this church. Lord, we, we are in troublesome times right now. We need for the church to be revived. That's the only hope. And I pray, God, that we might take this seriously. If my people call by my name shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And, Lord, we know that's an Old Testament promise to Israel, but we believe it has New Testament application as well. So help us, help us, Father, to really, really be open this week to what you desire to do in our lives and in the life of this church. I pray if we have those in our midst who have not trusted Christ, that today might be the day. Help all of us to be challenged and encouraged and motivated from your word. May we allow your word to correct errant behavior in our lives. Holy Spirit of God, be present in a strong way in this service. We'll give you all the honor and glory. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's say our memory verse, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. That's what it's all about. Do all, not do some. Do all to the glory of God. So we need to ask ourselves the question, are we here for the honor and for the glory of God? Are we singing for the honor and for the glory of God? Are we agreeing in prayer for the honor and for the glory of God? Are we giving of our time, talents, resources, finances for the honor and for the glory of God? And... Are we going to give attention to God's word when his messenger is speaking for the honor and for the glory of God? That's what it's all about. That's what we're supposed to do in our lives. That's what we're supposed to do in this service. And so I pray that you'll take that seriously. Those who are visiting with us, thank you so much for being here today. If you did not receive a welcome packet, just lift your hand if you did not receive a welcome packet, anyone in that category. If you have a welcome packet, on the inside there's a visitor's card. Just fill that out completely so that we can have a record of your visit. Uh, we are delighted that you came here. We realize there are many churches in our area, and you could have chosen any of those churches, but you chose to come here, and we appreciate that very much. We trust you'll be blessed and helped. If I can help you in any way, please see me. I'll be at the back door at the end of the service. Thank you so much for being here. You may be seated. We're going to sing some songs, some old songs that you're familiar with. Revive us again. Here we go. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus 
For thy spirit of light Who has shown us our Savior And scattered our night Hallelujah, thine the glory Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah, thine the glory Revive us again All glory and praise To the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Send the light, send the light. There's a call comes ringing. Send the light. What a great song. I've been singing this all of my life. There's a call comes ringing for the restless wait. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rest. And there are souls to say. Send the light. Send the light. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown of love. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Jesus saves. You believe that today? Jesus saves. Sing it. Sing it out. Here we go. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Give the wind a mighty voice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And all God's people said, he's still in the saving business. And I know it's harder and harder for people to understand their sinful condition because of the humanistic society we live in, but God is still saving people, and we are so thankful for that. Now, we're not passing plates, haven't done that uh, since I fell off my dinosaur, it seems like. Long, long time. But let's be faithful in giving to God's work, and we have the plates out at the uh, 
uh, cabinets back here as well as the information desk. Now, some of you may be wondering about uh, the evangelist. Brother Dave has been in five churches where I have served. He's never asked me for anything, uh, nothing, not travel allowance or anything. He's always come strictly on a love offering basis. And so people generally are very gracious in giving to his ministry and generally just in grac uh, gracious here across the board. I'm very thankful for that. We need to rise to the challenge this week. Now, I do have an offering plate back there to my right, right next to Kim Prommel on the um, sound cabinet, and that is for evangelist Dave Kisser. I realize that some of you may be putting it with your normal, um, your normal giving offering envelope. I understand that. But if you want to give cash, whatever it may be, or you want to give strictly to evangelist Dave Kisser, just put it in that offering plate. Just make out any checks to... Our ministry, we make sure that every single penny, whenever you give to a guest speaker, every single penny goes to that individual, and we will, we will honor uh, your desire and reference to that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue in the service. Father, I thank you for the faithful giving of your people here at Bible Baptist. Such a blessing. I thank you for them rising to the challenge recently with the uh, concrete, uh, the parking lot repair. We thank you for the graciousness of your people in giving to that, and we anticipate that being done soon. I pray also, or, or thank you rather, for the graciousness of your people in reference to uh, evangelist Jimmy Davis, who was here while I was out of town on vacation. Our people were so gracious to him, and we want to be gracious to your servant, evangelist Dave Kisser. So help us to rise once again to the challenge. To whom much is given, much is required. You've given us so much, Father. I pray that we might be people of extreme generosity, as I mentioned last week. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Help us, Lord, to be people who are generous. Bless in this service as we continue. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Appreciate that so much. In just a few minutes, Dave Kisser will come and speak. And I've known uh, Brother Dave since the 80s, met him in the first ministry where Nellie and I served in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been in five different churches, and in all those churches, I've had Brother Dave come and minister. And always a tremendous blessing to the church, to me personally. I want you to know that. I'm so thankful that you can be here with us today. God has blessed his ministry, and uh, he's on a radio. He's on the radio daily, Monday through Friday, on 600 radio stations, and dealing with uh, social, cultural, political issues from a biblical perspective, presenting a biblical worldview, and that's so needed in this day and time. And I appreciate the fact that he's not afraid to address social, cultural, political issues in his preaching. I know that's not accepted by all. I don't really understand that, to be frank with you. There are people uh, across the board in our churches, really, who have swallowed this lie that we should never talk about politics in church. And uh, the devil's laughed his head off, and that's, that's one of the reasons that we're in this shape right now in our nation, because prophets of God have not boldly thundered forth the Word of God, applying it to all facets of life. That includes the cultural arena. That includes the social arena. That includes the political arena. And I'm thankful that he doesn't shy away from that. He's bold as a lion. He's never compromised all these years. And he has faced some backlash uh, from time to time, but he stood firm. And I appreciate that so much about his ministry. God has given him a ministry in Washington, D.C. His son uh, heads that ministry, still heads that ministry, correct? Hope to the Hill in Washington. I'm sure Dave will talk to you about that. But uh, he leaves it all on the field when he preaches. If you've not heard Dave Kister, you'll be blessed. Open your hearts. Let him, uh, let God, I should say, minister to you through his servant. Dave Kister. Before he comes, we're going to all stand and sing, Here I Am to Worship. That's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Here I am to worship. Sing it with me now. Let's honor the Lord, for He is worthy. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. That made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, praise his name. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created all for love's sake became born so here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me we'll never know folks we'll never know i'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross i'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross I'll never know 
am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together our creator he's our redeemer he's our savior he's our friend and today we worship him we ascribe the worth that is due his name king of kings lord of lords we praise you we bless you in this house of worship and all god's people said amen you may be seated well, amen. Great to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be here? Amen. Well, I want you to know I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the very kind remarks that Pastor Mark had to say, and he did that even after me wearing my Alabama tie today. And uh, anyways, how many of you noticed the Alabama tie? Some of y'all did? Okay, you're very observant people. But anyway, uh, let me tell you, let me just say this, and uh, let me just chat with you for a few minutes. I love this church, and uh, I've got dear friends here. Thank God for um, Pastor Mark inviting me to Bible Baptist Church. I love you folk. When I drove in last night, I felt a little bit like I was arriving at home. I really did feel that way. I love this place. love Pastor Mark, Miss Nelly, their family, but I've grown to love you folks dearly. And I know many of you pray for us, and for that I cannot thank you enough. Uh, the last 15 months has been about the longest 10 years of our life, has it not? And uh, I, I just want you to know I am thrilled to be back here without any of the restrictions, I mean, for the most part. And I understand, you know, um, protocols, and I get all of that. But I just, uh, I'm just glad to live in America right now. And uh, I, want to, I want America to continue to be free. Anyway, all of that to say this, uh, Alabama did win the national championship this year. They did. And uh, every year, uh, the game before the Iron Bowl, the Iron Bowl is when they always play Pastor Mark's favorite team, uh, the Auburn Tigers. And uh, Pastor was asking us in Sunday school to share some things about uh, ourselves that, uh, that people did not know. And we didn't get all the way around the room. By the way, that, that Sunday school class was amazing. If you don't love Jesus and root for Alabama, you're all, oh, that's good stuff. I like that. Okay, uh, somebody, somebody, did Pastor Mark set that up? Is this, is this what this is or... Tonight, Jeff. Jim Long is subject to church discipline. <laughs> Everyone, I'm serious about this. <laughs> oh, isn't it great to laugh in the house of the Lord? Amen. A lot to be joyful about. Anyway, all of that to say this, I was going to share if they'd gotten around the room to me that I actually attended Auburn Stadium one time. Brother Mark, you didn't know I did that, I don't think, but I did. Uh, I felt like a traitor posted pictures of that beautiful stadium. People that are my Alabama friends said, you're a traitor to the cause. And I took a lot of flack for that. But uh, I did get to go on the Auburn campus and go inside the stadium. It was an awesome experience. The game was not going on at the time, but it was uh, really something. Anyway, all of that to say this, one of the reasons I do love Alabama so much is not just the quality of the football team and the caliber of the program they produce, but my brother had attended uh, Alabama games for a number of years, and he kept pressing me, pressing me. About five years ago, he said, Dave, you got to go with me to be the best sports experience you ever have and uh, I thought he was overselling it to be honest with you he wasn't uh, folks honestly you have not lived until you have joined your voice with 104,000 other people all singing Sweet Home Alabama at the same time that is an awesome experience any way you want to slice it but I'll tell you what's amazing uh, two years ago not last year the COVID year uh, we didn't get to go to the game because of the way things were done but anyway, the long and short is, a year prior to that, 2019, we had gone to, to see Alabama play. I think it was the Citadel. They always play a lower-ranked team before the, the Iron Bowl. 
But anyway, uh, at the end of the game, uh, we had a chance to meet the guy who manages the field there at Bryant-Denny Stadium. And uh, as we were conversing with him, wonderful Christian gentleman, I said, uh, the other five guys, six guys that are with me are all wanting a steak dinner because we've been here yelling and screaming and watching Alabama play. And what is the best steakhouse you have in Tuscaloosa? And he said, well, I'm going to send you to the place the Alabama coaching staff goes every Friday night before a Saturday home game. He said, I'm just going to caution you. The environment, as far as the decor, he said, it's nothing super special. It's very nice, but it's nothing really to write home about. But the steak will be the best steak you ever have anywhere in the world. That's the way he worded it. I thought, man, that's an exaggeration. Can I say this? He was not exaggerating it. Preacher, that was absolutely absolutely the best steak I've ever had. I don't know how they cooked it. don't know what they did to season it. It was the best steak I've ever had. And I've eaten steak, you know, numbers of places around the United States and around the world. It was absolutely great. Well, what impressed me was this. When I walked into that establishment, hanging up very central in the restaurant were the Ten Commandments. All around the room were statements like this, not I but Christ. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I walked up, the wife of the owner of the restaurant uh, greeted me and I said, Ma'am, I've got to ask you a question. How long have you had the Ten Commandments up in your restaurant? She said, for 24 years. 24 years. Now, we're in a culture that does not like that kind of thing. And so I just asked her, I said, have you had any complaints about it being up? She said, not in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. That's the way she worded it. And uh, I thought, wow, praise God for Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Praise God for the great city of Auburn, Alabama. Listen, folk, what I'm trying to tell you is this. This is the time to live out our faith in an aggressive way. And what I appreciated so much about everything I saw at Alabama was there's many, many people on the coaching staff that are committed believers in Jesus Christ, and those assistant coaches take the players to church, and they live out their faith in a very aggressive way. One final thing I want to say to you, because this is service at its best. Uh, the Alabama Stadium, Bryant-Denny, actually had the upper-level decks built later. And though from the sky and from the outside, it looks like a bowl. It is technically not a bowl. And what I mean by that is this. You can't go in on this side of the stadium and on the inside walk around either way to get to the other side of the stadium. You have to go in where your seating is because of the way the initial stadium was and the way they've built around it. Well, anyway, when we arrived there two years ago, we should have been on this end of the stadium, but we actually got on this side of the stadium and uh, when we got inside, I, I couldn't locate our seats. And so I went to a guy and I said, you know, we can't find our seats. And he said, well, let me tell you why. He said, you're on the totally opposite side of the stadium from where you're supposed to be. And so uh, here's how I learned it's not like a bowl. You can't walk around uh, fully on the inside. I said, well, we can just walk around. He said, well, no, technically you can't. He said, let me tell you, you got to go back outside. And he said, go around. And then he paused for a second. He said, uh, that may be a little bit confusing. He said, let me do this. He said, let me just take you over there. What he did is called on his radio, got someone else to fill in for him as they greeted people that arrived and checked tickets. And that gentleman walked us literally all the way around the stadium to the other side and got us safely to our seats. And on the way over there, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, uh, how long have you worked here? He said, I've worked here uh, at the University of Alabama on Saturdays for home games for about 35 years. He said, I do it as volunteer, but he said, I just love it. I said, well, let me say this to you. I said, I have never been so impressed uh, that you're willing to actually leave your post, have somebody fill in for you, and walk us around to our seat. I've been to a lot of sporting events. That's never happened before. He said, well, we just love people here at the University of Alabama, and we just want to help out and make the experience the best it can possibly be. I don't know about you, but that's good stuff. Would you agree with me? That's just good stuff that people are servant-oriented. I know the University of Alabama is not the only place that happens, but we live in a culture that is self-absorbed. It's all about me. It's all about my feelings. It's all about what I want. It's all about my comfort. And that almost 72-year-old man, if he'd have been interested in comfort, he wouldn't have walked us all the way outside and all the way around to the other side of the stadium. But he did it because he had a servant's heart and uh, I was impressed by that. And so I will tell you this, I do love Alabama football because of the quality of it, but I love a lot of other things more about what goes on down there. And uh, I praise God for it. Again, it is a delight and a blessing to be here. Let me just mention a couple of things to you very, very quickly. I hate commercials, especially during an Alabama football game. But anyway, I, so I don't want this to sound like a commercial, all right? But uh, I do have these pins that I'm wearing on my lapel. I may have had them when I was here last time because they had just come out. I'm not sure if I did or not. But they're on a little card just like this. By the way, this was 
designed not initially for you or for me. These were designed for members of Congress. Back in February, right before COVID kicked into high gear, we did our, our, our quarterly outreach to every member of Congress. And what we do during those outreaches is we visit every single office of every single member of Congress. And I had my phone in my pocket back in February of 2020. And over three days, we walked 18 miles over three days, an average of six miles a day, visiting every single office on Capitol Hill. And every time we go to visit, we always take something with us. This particular time, we took this little pen, a card on the inside. If you open the card up and look at it and read it, it has verses of Scripture, explains to a member of Congress or a member of the Senate why we are presenting this to them and asking them to wear it. It is in the shape of the United States Capitol. Up in the dome of the Capitol are three words. Words. I'm going to mention those in just a minute. Down here at the base of the pen is our ministry on Capitol Hill, Hope to the Hill. But up in the dome are the three words that we end every conversation with on Capitol Hill when we part company from a member of Congress. It may be in their office. It may be somewhere in the Capitol building. It may be out on the sidewalk. But when we part company from every member of Congress, we always conclude with this three-word question, can we pray? Can we pray? Do you know we've never been turned down one time? Prayer is free. But the ramifications of it are priceless. Can I hear an amen? Never one time been turned down uh, offering to pray with and pray for members of Congress. So we did these pins and are encouraging members of Congress initially to wear them because the need in our country right now transcends anything political. Can I hear an amen? The answer to America's ills is spiritual, always has been, is now, and always will be. Of course, there's political ramifications for bad choices, but the answer to America's problems is spiritual. And so what we're trying to get them to understand is that this is a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem in our country. Would you be willing to wear these? And many members of Congress took us up on this. Well, it went so well, we decided we're going to try to get people in churches to get on board as well and commit to wear one of these and pray for revival in America. Now, if you already have one because I had them last time, and I'm sorry, my, my memory's good, just short. But anyway, I don't remember so much has happened in the last uh, 15 months. But the bottom line is this. If you don't have one of these and would like one, please see me. I have some back there on the table for a very minimal amount. I'd love to give them to you. But I'll just be honest and very transparent with you. These are very expensive to produce. They're high quality. They have to be. Your members of Congress won't even look at them and certainly would not be willing to wear them. So everything has to be done high quality because they're used to that on Capitol Hill. And by the way, we should do it high quality for the king that we love and serve. His name is Jesus Christ. So uh, they cost a little bit to put together, especially to put them into the packet with a card like this. But uh, I'll let you have one for a minimal, very minimal amount. If you'll commit to do two things, read the card and then commit to wear the pen. And then a third thing, and the most important thing, commit to pray for revival in America. Folks, I'm telling you, we sit on the precipice of one of two things right now in our nation, and that is ruin or revival, ruin or revival. There is really no middle ground right now. Would you agree with me? It's ruin or revival. And uh, the battle lines have been drawn between good and evil, right and wrong, light and darkness. You say it's a D versus R battle. No, it has nothing to do with politics right now. It has to do with light and darkness, right and wrong, good and evil. And uh, those battle lines have been drawn, really not by us, but by the wicked one and his emissaries. And so we've been thrust into something that really is not of our doing, not of our making. Uh, I would never wish on the United States of America anything like I believe could come unless we have revival. But, folk, I'm telling you, right now is the time for God's people to wake up. Now is the time for us to aggressively live out our faith. Now is the time for us to be bold in our witness for Christ. Now is the time for us to understand understand the makeup of this country. How were we founded? Folk, do you understand there was a time, and I apologize for doing this, there was a time the black robed regiment, in fact that phrase was coined by a British general who said we fear more during the American Revolution, we fear more the black robed regiment than we do the colonial regulars. You know who the black robed regiment were? They were the preachers who wore their black robes in the pulpit, but many of them left their pulpit, picked up a musket, and fought for liberty in the United States of America. Pastor, many of those guys in the early days leading up to the Revolutionary War, they didn't know if the British were going to invade their church while they were preaching, so they'd walk into their pulpit, they'd lay their musket up against the pulpit on either side, not knowing if they might have to use it before the service was over. You say, preacher, guns in church? There's probably some in this room right now. Praise God for it. 
not going to identify the persons that are caring, but I am saying this. Folk, listen, those days were unique, and the preachers led the charge. Every time we go to the United States Capitol building, by the way, this is not being taught anymore. It hadn't been for a long time. Statuary Hall in the United States Capitol has two statues from every state. In fact, so many statues now that they've had to put some statues down in what's called the crypt. The crypt is the, the floor below the rotunda of the Capitol, and there's supports holding up that massive dome of the Capitol. It is in the crypt. That's why they call it the crypt, because that's where they wanted George Washington to be buried, our first president. He did not want to be buried there. He wanted to be buried in his palatial home out in Mount Vernon, uh, out on the Potomac River. And by the way, if you've ever visited there, you need to take the time. If you haven't done so to go down to the grave of George and Martha because over their tomb these words are printed I am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die can I hear an amen right there George Washington was a committed believer and follower of Jesus Christ that is the history of our country anyway when you get down into the crypt there is one statue there it's identified as being from the state of Pennsylvania because the man depicted in the statue is was originally from Pennsylvania he later became a pastor in Woodstock Virginia. His name was Peter Muhlenberg. Peter Muhlenberg was one of the Black Robe Regiment. He left his church, led the 8th Virginia Regiment, and God used him in a powerful way. In the early days of this country, he was one of many that God used in a mighty way. And I am praying that God will raise up a Black Robe Regiment in the year 2021. God's preachers need to be bold, courageous, forthright, direct. We don't need to run from anything in fear. We need to be running to things in faith and allowing God to use us in these days. If the preachers don't step up and if they don't act as your pastor has acted, if they don't take on the mantle of leadership and sense of responsibility that your pastor has taken on, and I don't know about you, but I thank God for Pastor Mark Smith. And you ought to let him know how much you appreciate him. I thank God for him, for his courageous leadership all the way through coronavirus, as well as before and well after all of that. I thank God for him. But if we don't have men like him, more of them, if I could duplicate him and spread him all over America, just changing one thing, his love of Auburn, if I could just do that, uh, I, I would do so, all right, I would, because not many pastors have the backbone and the courage and the commitment to the Lord, to the Word, and to you that your pastor has. And I thank God for him. I'm going to get a little teared up when I say this, but preacher, I love you. I thank God so much for you, and uh, we need more men like this in the United States of America. So anyway, if you're interested in one of these, let me know. And then I want to invite you to take your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. And while you're turning, by way of introduction, let me, let me, just, let me just ask, um, how many of you in here think, or maybe you know because you were tested, how many of you think maybe you got COVID or you know for sure you had COVID at some point? All right, numbers of you. All right, my wife and I think we probably got it in November of 2020, November of last year. I, I lost sense of taste and smell for, for a few days. My wife lost sense of smell. And preacher, I'll tell you this, when you cannot smell and taste a steak, you know you're in trouble. You know what I'm talking about? My greatest concern, seriously, was I won't be able to taste my steak anymore. Well, the fact of the matter is this, and I know this is not everybody's story, but for my wife and I, it was nothing, okay? I'm just, I know that's not everybody's situation, may not have been yours. Uh, my saying, what I'm about to say is not a denial of the reality of the virus and the seriousness of, of it for some people. This, that's not my point. I'm just saying for me, it was nowhere near as bad as the flu, okay? It was over and done, but my wife and I have virtually no underlying health issues at all. In fact, I, I have none. Some of you are thinking, yes, you do. You got some mental issues. Well, anyway, um, preacher not long ago, a guy asked me a couple weeks ago, he said, what are you on? What are you on? How do you have so much energy? I said, well, I'm not really on anything, but I have figured this out. The Holy Spirit plus Mountain Dew equals awesome. I'm just going to tell you, it does. The Holy Spirit plus Mountain Dew equals awesome. Anyway, bottom line is this. Uh, we had no underlying health issues, so we were through it over and, and done with it. We were not tested because it was during the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, the week prior to that and into Thanksgiving, so we were kind of quarantined already at home. So anyway, all of that to say this. Looking back on it, folks, there are some things that you do have to just smile about relative to COVID. You say, preach, what are you talking about? Have any of you done this or made the mistake of doing this, being in the grocery store and be going down the grocery aisle the wrong way, contrary to the arrows? Have any of y'all done that and been chewed out? 
my wife was mercilessly chewed out by a lady. What are you doing? You know, going the wrong way. My wife said, I'm just looking for products. I didn't know, you know, we had to, you know, one way, one way aisles. I, did, I didn't understand that. Uh, have any of you been walking down an aisle and somebody's so scared of you, they pff, buried themselves in the cereal boxes to get away from you? I had that happen. Preacher, this, this is one of my favorites. The dots, the dots, you know, are six feet apart in the grocery line. But the cash registers this way are not six feet apart which means you got people in line, they're not six feet apart, which tells you the virus was so smart. It knew to infect you on the vertical, but not the horizontal. Right? How many of you have flown during COVID? I have flown a lot during COVID, okay? Now, listen, there is no social distancing on an airplane. You're crammed in there like sardines during COVID, but here's the deal. You must wear a mask unless you are actively eating or drinking. I want you to think about the insanity of this. Mask up unless you're actively eating and drinking. I told my wife, I said, honey, you know what I'm going to do? The minute I sit down, I'm taking the cap off my water and I'm holding my water the entire time. <laughs> my mask can be down. If they walk by, I'll... I'll Because you know what they're telling you? As long as you have that bottle of water in your hand or an item of food in your hand, you're safe. But the minute you put that down, oh, get that mask up because you're unsafe. But the minute you pick that water back up, whew, you're safe again. Have we lost our minds? You say, preacher, you're denying the reality. No, I'm not denying the reality. I'm not concerned so much right now about the reality of the virus. I'm concerned about our insane response to the reality of the virus. Wow. Wow, have any of you had this experience? Driving through Taco Bell, Conley Springs, excuse me, Eichard, North Carolina. Preacher, I ordered a sweet tea, $2.02, $2.02. And so I get up to the window, get my $3 out, get ready to hand it to the guy. He, he said, no, no, no. He extends a cup through the window. You know, like he scared him. He said, put, put, put your dollar bills in the cup, which I did. He takes the cup inside. With the very hand I would have deposited them into, he takes them out of the cup, puts them in the cash register, gets the change, doesn't hand it to me, drops it back in the cup, and extends it to me and pours it into my hand. Preacher with this hand tears the receipt off and just hands me that. <laughs> Have we lost our minds? One final example. Last summer, my wife and I spent a little bit of time out west in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Anybody ever been to Jackson Hole? Isn't it, isn't it a beautiful place? I love the, you know, the antlers, you know, in the four corners of the town square. A lot of the restaurants closed, you know, and they just had a table, couldn't go in and sit down. Some restaurants were open uh, last July. But anyway, the ones that weren't open, you could, they had a table across their front. They had a couple of cash registers on the table. You could go up to the table. They'd give you a very limited menu from which you could order. They'd go back and get those limited items, and they'd bring them to you, and then you had to sit out on one of the park benches out on the, the square to to eat your meal. Well, my wife said, she said, honey, I'm thirsty. Would you, would you mind going and getting a Coke? So I walk up to this table and I said, I like a Coke, you know, just a can of Coke with a cup of ice, if you don't mind. Well, the guy brings both of them to me. I reach in my wallet, pull it out, get ready to pay cash. He said, oh, no, 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 sir. He said, we're not accepting cash, just card. Now here again, this is the brilliance of the virus. It knows only to attach itself to cash. It will avoid a card. So we're only accepting debit or credit card. I said, can I say something? And this young man was so nice. I was not trying to embarrass him, not trying to make life difficult for him, but somebody else was going to if I didn't point this out. He said, we're not accepting cash, only card. I said, well, actually, you are accepting cash. And the reason I said that is a cup, just like this one with the letters T-I-P-S, tips on the front of it, was just to the right of the cash register and there were dollar bills in it. I said, you actually are accepting cash. He put his hands on his hips and he said, we are not. I said, well, if you're not and that's not cash, I'll be glad to take that off. And I grab He said, no, 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 you can't touch that. 
And then he realized what I just said. And he looked at the cup and looked at me, looked at the cup. He said, you know what? We are actually accepting cash, aren't we? I said, yeah, you really are. I said, uh, now I'll pay with a card if that'll help you. He said, yeah, he would. And I said, oh, I'll be delighted to do that. But I said, all I want to suggest to you is that maybe you not say we're not accepting cash because you are and somebody's going to get really upset with you. He said, sir, thank you so much. I walked away thinking this. Fear has caused us to operate in insane ways. And yet the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And folks, I want to encourage you. The Sunday school class today was so powerful, talking about the impact of the Word of God in your life, changing not only behavior, but changing incorrect thinking. And what I would challenge all of us is to do in the rest of year 2021 is immerse ourselves in the Word of God so that we can think correctly with respect to all kinds of lies that are being told us literally daily. One final thing. Preacher, can I, ju can I just speak truth? I, I, okay, I'm going to anyway, but I, I, won't, I want you to give me an exclamation point. I love you, brother, I do. Um, January 6, 2021, an event occurred at the U.S. Capitol. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I spent 30 days in Facebook jail. So, I, I mean, you're looking, at a, you're looking at a convict. I mean, really, you are a Facebook convict. 30 days in Facebook jail, bunch of stuff censored before and after. I spent my time in Facebook jail for merely making this statement on Facebook in print. What I'd said was tomorrow, the next day, I am going to be on a national radio program being interviewed so that I might share my story of what happened at the very peaceful protest at the White House on January 6th. And the words that got me in trouble with Facebook were very peaceful protest and the two words, White House. However, folks, I was there. I was there. My twin brother was there. His son, six feet, three inches of him, was there as well. Now, folks, honestly, I stood in a crowd of, I'm guessing, one million plus people. Now, I know the media said this. One of them said, the, CNN or MSNBC, there were 45,000 people there. One of them said maybe 150,000 people there. Folks, listen to me. When you leave the Capitol building, you go one mile, one mile from the U.S. Capitol to the Washington Monument. If you look right from the Washington Monument, Capitol back here, one mile to the Washington Monument, look to the right, you're looking at the back of the, of the White House. The backyard of the White House is called the Ellipse. The ellipse, that ellipse will accommodate at least, at least 75,000 people. Preacher, that day, January 6th, the ellipse was totally cram-packed with people all the way across Constitution Avenue, all the way over to the Washington Monument, and for one mile further, which is the distance it is from the Washington Monument, one mile further to the Lincoln Memorial, it was wall-to-wall -wall people. Based on the three crusades we've done in D.C., the U.S. Park Service chief told me this multiple times with his own mouth, those panels, one mile from the Capitol to the Washington Monument, another mile from the Monument down to the Lincoln Memorial, those two panels will each accommodate one million people each so we're talking jam-packed wall-to-wall people for one mile 70,000 at least over here rough estimate folks total number of people there one million plus people I have never stood in a crowd preacher I'm not kidding packed tightly like we were for six hours literally I could barely turn I had to turn like this do you know people dropped gloves and could not, because they're so tightly packed, they could not reach down to pick them up? It would have been uncomfortable except for the fact, do you know what we did for six hours waiting for the president to speak? We sang, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light. We sang songs like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the... Do you know there was no animosity? A million plus people, preacher, and not one occurrence of anybody getting upset, swinging a punch, doing anything inappropriate. Is everybody listening to me? For six hours... 
When Donald Trump ended his speech, and this is not a promotion of Donald Trump. Please don't accuse me of, of trying to be political. That is not my point. When he finished his speech, I took a picture as he exited the stage at 1.12 p.m. Time stamped on my phone. 1.12 is when he finished his speech. He said this as he concluded. Now, we're going to make our way up Constitution Avenue all the way to the U.S. Capitol. Remember, it's one mile, one mile from where we are up to the Capitol for a very peaceful, and he did use the word, and patriotic. He used that word as well, for a very peaceful and patriotic protest. Well, it took, Mark, I'm not kidding. We were so jam-packed. It took 15 minutes for us to even move Everybody starts up Constitution Avenue. I told my brother and I told his son, I said, guys, look, don't follow the crowd up Constitution Avenue. Don't go up the paved street. Let's go over and go up the grassy area of the National Mall. Otherwise, it'll take us two hours following this massive crowd to get to Capitol Hill. Let's go over in the grass. So we went over into the grass, started up Capitol Hill. Preacher, no sooner than we got past the Washington Monument, I heard and saw the first of four explosions all the way up at the Capitol building. Somebody is setting off incendiary devices. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is something was already underway before we even got there. Now the media has been forced to admit it, and thankfully they have had to admit it. The incursion into the Capitol began at about 20 minutes to one. We were not dismissed until 12 minutes after one, over a half hour later. What I'm trying to tell you is the people that initiated the incursion into the Capitol were not the people a mile away down at the White House. The people that started that were anarchists who came to D.C. for no other reason than to do something, and I believe ultimately tried to blame it, illegitimately so, on people that were not responsible for the incursion. Now, yes, 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 I'm very quick to admit, yes, when the crowd finally did get up there, about 400 people, and they're all serving time as they should for unlawful entry. Can I hear an amen? 400 people went through the doors that had already been broken open and through some of the windows that had been broken and went illegitimately into the Capitol. Nothing in me screamed, hey, I want to go through a broken door into the Capitol. No. Nothing. I had no inclination to do that whatsoever. Some people tragically were lured in. They should not have done it, but they're going to serve a penalty for doing so as they should. But they're not the ones who started it. They're not. While we're standing there on the West Plaza where we do our Bible reading marathon every year. Preacher, I know every inch of that ground because that's where we do our Bible reading every first week of May. I'm standing there. My brother's to my right. His son's to my left. A guy runs by me. After we got to the Capitol with a rope, a massive rope in his hand like you'd tow a vehicle with. And I heard him say this, come on, this is our moment. And I thought, that's odd. You don't typically ever see a rope that large to do what? What's he going to do with it? You never see that. It's inappropriate. It's not, doesn't fit being there around the Capitol. I said to my brother, let's go see what that guy's going to do. So we work our way through a little bit of the milling crowd. He's tying the rope around a banister. On the other side of the barricade is the Capitol Police. They're going to try to pull this barricade over and storm a second wave I guess try to go past the Capitol Police who's put up a barricade preacher I'm sorry some of those guys that serve in the Capitol Hill Police Department are my friends I know them well I said to that guy what are you doing in fact I yelled it loudly I'm sorry I lost it I did and he looked at me and he said we're going to pull this over and this is our moment I said look if you're trying to make some kind of positive statement this is not the way to do it when behind me a man had slipped up, an anarchist, and preacher, he unleashed. In fact, I, I'd never heard the kind of language he unleashed at me and at my brother for merely trying to stop them from doing something illegitimate. These were not the people that were a mile away. Totally different atmosphere, totally different attitude, totally different demeanor. Preacher... Those guys came at us, and I thought, we're going to have a physical altercation, all right? Me, my brother, his son, yes, his son is six foot three. But you know what? I thank God for the American teenager, don't you? Two, listen, two African-American teenage boys stepped up to help the 60-year-old. That's what they did. Can I hear an amen right there? It was awesome. Those two teenage boys stepped up, and the five of us stopped them from pulling over a barricade. Now, folks, I want you to listen to me. What I'm trying to tell you is I related that. What I just told you in print on Facebook 
and was announcing my intent to tell that, which ultimately did, on a radio program nationwide, and Facebook banned me for 30 days. The fact checkers at Facebook weren't there. I was. The fact checkers were not there. I was. What I'm trying to tell you, folks, is this. We are being lied to on a regular basis. And somebody's going to have to have the courage to straighten their spine, stand up where they used to do it. By the way, in the early days of this country, there were newspapers, yes. There was no television, obviously. Do you know where people went to get their news? They went to church. And the preachers kept themselves aware and abreast of what was going on, especially in the days of the American independence, war for independence. And they communicated to their people the truth. So their people were well informed. What I'm telling you, MSNBC is not going to tell you. CNN is not going to communicate to you. So preacher, why are you taking time to do this? Because you need to know the truth about what happened and the fact that we're being lied to on a daily basis. By the way, some of the lies are coming to the surface and they're having to answer for them as they should. And by the way, I have, yes, yes I have, I have joined the lawsuit that President Trump has filed against Facebook, Twitter, and Google. I have joined it. I have. It's a class action suit. And you, if you have been censored on Facebook, you can go to this website, takeonbigtech.com, takeonbigtech.com, takeonbigtech.com. You'll be asked to share your story in print. And then somebody at some point will get a hold of you. You say, preacher, why is this so important? Because, folks, our country right now is at stake. This is not a lightweight thing that's going on. The advance of Marxism in our nation, courtesy of people that have been elected to high office, is stunning. This is Marxism. And what we need right now, like we've never needed before, are courageous preachers and courageous men and women in the pulpit. And having said that, I want you to look at 1 Samuel chapter number 13. I want to read to you verse 13 of 1 Samuel 13, where the scripture says this, And Samuel said to Saul, by the way, Samuel is the prophet, Saul is the king of Israel, Thou hast done foolishly. Look what Samuel said, Thou hast done foolishly. Now what's led up to this verse is this, Samuel has told King Saul, I want you to go and I want you to tarry. I'm going to be where I'm telling you to go. Just wait. I'll be there in seven days. Pastor, you remember the story? The seven days come and go. Saul is there. The people get a little bit irritated because the prophet hadn't shown up. So what Saul does is this. He makes himself do something that was not his to do. He intrudes into the priest's office and he offers a sacrifice on an altar. As the smoke of that sacrifice is ascending, the Bible says Samuel arrives and he looks at Saul and says what in the world are you doing I want you to listen to the motivation of the leader of Israel King Saul he said I saw the people were scattered great way of saying it today is this my poll numbers were slipping a little bit so I forced myself I made myself do something that I knew was wrong look folk we don't ever do wrong it's called pragmatism if you do something to try to stop something else from just do right can I hear an amen and because Saul did not do right I want you to look what Samuel says to him look again at verse 13 thou hast done foolishly thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God which he commanded thee. For now, look at this. This is an amazing statement. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. In other words, sir, you would not have only been king, but your son after you, Jonathan, and his descendants after him. You guys would have been on the throne forever if you had just obeyed God. But you didn't do it. Look at verse 14. But now, thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his, God's, own heart. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, just to cut to the chase, God finds the man after his own heart in the form of a shepherd boy by the name of David. I want you to understand, Saul was head and shoulders taller than all the other men of Israel. He looked the part of a king. David is a shepherd boy. He may not have looked like a king, but he sure had the heart of a king. Can I hear an amen right there? I don't care what you look like. I don't care what your physical stature is. If you have a heart after the heart of God, God places his stamp of approval on you. Folks, look, we've got to get over all this stuff of race and what somebody looks like. And somebody's stirring the ethnic pot all the time, trying to foster division in our country. And one of the ways 
they're doing it is through this insidious thing called critical race theory. It is wrong. Preacher, it says basically there is no such thing as absolute truth. It also says that race ought to be the basis upon which the lens through which we view everything. No, we ought not view everything through the lens of race. Folks, listen, I don't care what your color is. If you're saved, you're my brother and sister in Christ. Can I hear an amen? This has got to, preacher, we keep scraping a scab off of a 170-year-old wound. Why? Because it advances somebody's political agenda. You say, preacher, the fact that you're saying that means you're a racist. No, it does not. I am not a racist. If all I did every time you saw me was do this. Well, you know the Japanese bombed us at Pearl Harbor. You know the Japanese... <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, the Japanese bombed us. Preacher, if every time you saw me, I was bringing up the Japanese. The Japanese bombed us. They said, what happened at Pearl Harbor? If, I, if that's all, I was just eating up with it. That's all I could talk about. You know if you love me, you know what you'd say to me? Preacher, that was 70 years ago. You weren't even alive. Move on. And he'd be telling me the truth. Let me ask you something. Why do we keep wanting to resurrect something from 170 years ago? Reparations. Folks, there's not a one of us in this room who's ever owned a slave. There's not a one of us in the room that's ever been a slave. How do I, how do, preacher, how, how is it possible for us today in the year 2021 to back up and make amends for something that happened 170 years ago? There's nothing we can do to do that. The only thing that make, can make amends for that or any other wrong is the blood of Jesus Christ. This is being stirred up because people have an agenda. And what they want to do is they want to use us as the pawns in their agenda. And I'll be honest with you, I refuse to be played as a pawn. Now, folk, again, nobody's going to tell you this, but you need to hear it. God's looking for people like David who have a heart after him. Now, I want you to look very quickly at 1 Samuel 17, four chapters over, and I want you to see what a man with a heart after the heart of God looks like. What does a man with a heart after the heart of God look like? I want you to look, if you would, please, 1 Samuel 17. Let your eyes rest on verse number 28. Now, watch the Bible, what it says here. And Eliab, his, the his is David, his eldest brother heard when he, David, spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Isn't it amazing, preacher, how people get angry against people that just want to do right? They just want to speak truth. I have had people get so mad at me. Literally, people call my phone every 10 seconds and say, I hope you die. I hope you get AIDS and die. The crowning, the crowning one, folks, was this. Somebody had the audacity to mail me an encased plastic bag of human feces to express their disapproval. By the way, that is a federal crime. And they accuse me of being hateful? No. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Look at the middle of verse 28. And he said, that is, Eliab said to David, Why camest thou down hither? What, what are you even doing here? You don't even deserve to have a, 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 a voice in the conversation. Boy, that's what's being told to some of us today. You don't even deserve as a preacher. Stay out of it. You don't have a voice. In, yes, we have a voice in the conversation. Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wood? Look how he demeans his brother, tries to put him down. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You showed up here because, brother, all you want to do is watch a fight break out. I want you to watch David's response. By the way, this is the response from man or woman with a heart after the heart of God. Look at verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Brother, what, what, what have I done wrong? Is there not a, would you say the next word out loud? A cause. Do you understand people with a heart after the heart of God are people with a cause? Let me ask you, what's your cause? By the way, the cause in David's case was not him. The cause in our case cannot and should not be us. Can I hear a name? It's not about us. It's not about my agenda. It's not about my comfort. It's not about my wishes. It's not about what I want. It's not about any of that. It's about the glory of God. And folk, the facts are these. America was founded for the glory of God. Now we're being, young people are being told a lie today. They are. All you have to do is back up and read. <laughs> read what was penned in the year 1620. 
the Mayflower Compact, and they will tell you why the pilgrims said they're coming to this land. They stated it clearly in the Mayflower Compact. They said we're coming, listen, quote, for the advancement of the Christian faith. Can I hear an amen right there? We're coming so we can worship God according to the dictates of our conscience and according to the word of God to advance the Christian faith. That's why we're here. Amen. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you, folks, is this. We're going to lose all of it if we're not careful. People need to develop and cultivate a heart after the heart of God and have a cause. May I say this, preacher? My number one cause is not America, though I love my country. By the way, if you cut me, I bleed red, white, and blue, and I'm not going to apologize for that. I, I saw that flag, preacher. I'm still glad you f- fly one in your church in a Christian flag. Do you know in 1976, my dad had a, a choir come and do a, a 200th anniversary from 1776 to 1976. America was 200 years old. And preacher, that choir, it was an amazing group of people, did a song I have never heard it since. Only heard it one time. But see, there's a quirk of my mind. It's crazy. If I hear it one time, if it's set to music or in poetry, heaven help, if it's music and poetry, I can't forget it. Can I quote you the words of that song they sang? Proudly she waves, O glory, over the land of the free. Promise of hope and freedom, symbol of liberty. Red, white, and blue are her colors, colors both brilliant and clear, colors with far deeper meaning than that at first may appear. Red is for blood of patriots who have died to free us. White is for justice and government of law. Blue is for honor and faith in all we do. This is my flag. This is, oh glory, the red, white, and blue. How dare, how dare a local group of Black Lives Matter people say that is a symbol of divisiveness and racism? It is not. It is a symbol of freedom. Can I hear an amen? There's a re-education taking place in this country and we're being lied to. My cause, though I love America, is not first and foremost America. My first and foremost cause is Americans. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to understand what we've experienced, that no Christ. It doesn't mean we're better than you. It just means our sin's forgiven, and we know that when we leave this life, we're going to heaven for eternity. I want you to know that spiritual freedom. And by the way, physical freedom represented by that flag is nothing but an extension of spiritual freedom available in Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? By the way, you need to look up a great book called Witness. Witness. Does the name Alger Hiss ring a bell with anybody in here? The Alger Hiss spy ring? Part of that Alger Hiss spy ring, by the way, he's the guy who turned state's evidence and ultimately gave all the evidence to the FBI and to the federal government to actually do something about the Alger Hiss spy ring. That guy's name was Whitaker Chambers. You know what Whitaker Chambers said? Whitaker Chambers was a lost man. Whitaker Chambers had a lot of sin going on in his life. But preacher, he turned state's evidence. Some Christians came across his path. Whitaker Chambers got saved. And in his book, Witness, it's got a double meaning. Witness against Alger Hiss. But more importantly now, he's a witness for Jesus Christ. That's where the title of the book comes from. It's powerful. He said this, and I quote, Physical freedom is nothing but an extension of the spiritual freedom found in Jesus Christ. He is 100% correct. That's why the Bible says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Free. People with a heart after the heart of God are people with a cause. Number two, I want you to watch this. Not only are people with a heart after the heart of God people with a cause, number two, they're people with courage. Courage. You say, Brother Dave, what do you mean? Look at verse 31. I want you to watch this. And when the words were heard which David spake, They rehearsed them before Saul, and he, Saul, sent for him. David arrives in Saul's tent. David basically says to King Saul this, No one has been willing to go shut the mouth of this giant that's been defying not only the armies of Israel, but he's been defying the God of the armies of Israel. If nobody else will take him on, I will. I don't know about you, I love this boy, don't you? King Saul says, if you remember, hey, you got to have some armor. Hey, 
Bring my armor. They put it on David. It engulfs him. He says, King, thanks, but no thanks. Gets rid of the armor. King says, what are you going to fight him with? He said, I'm going to take a sling and a stone. I'm going to take the giant down. He does precisely that. Now, what I want you to notice, preacher, I'd never noticed this until just COVID. Look at verse 40 of 1 Samuel 17. I want you to notice something. This is an amazing thing. I'd never seen this. It says, and he, David, took his staff in his hand and chose him, watch this, five smooth stones out of the brook. By the way, I've been to the valley of Elah where this battle took place. There is still a brook that runs through the valley, and yes, I did. I got me five smooth stones out of the brook, stuck them in my pocket, got them through security. They've been lined up on my desk back in Conley Springs. Can I hear an amen? Five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip, And his sling was in his hand. Please watch this last phrase. And he did what to the Philistine? Say the next two words. He did what? Say it again. He did what? One more time. He did what? Which means he went which direction? Toward him. Not from him. I want you to watch your Bible. Look over if you would please at verse number 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to David, that David, what's the next word? He did what? Hasted, it means he hurried up and what's the next word? Ran what direction? Toward the giant. Now, folk, look at me. All 10 feet tall, all 10 feet of his enemies standing right there in front of him. You think that guy, 10 feet tall, with a reputation that preceded him, you think this young shepherd boy who's never fought in battle, you think maybe he might have been a tad afraid and wanted to run from? Sure, but in the power of God, he didn't run from anything. He ran to it. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hasted and ran to. And you know what we've done? You know what many churches did, and maybe not you? For 15 months, preacher, run from in fear. Run from in fear. Run from in fear for 16 months. My brother said it well. He said, Dave, you know what? A lost world is watching us. And you know what? If we're paralyzed with fear over a virus we can't see, and by the way, the fact we can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. Of course it's real. But it's got a 99% recovery rate. A lost world is watching And they're forming an opinion of our God based on our response. I don't know about you, I love this boy. So infused with courage that he runs to the problem, not from it. People with a heart after the heart of God are people with a cause, people with courage. One final thing. I want you to look at verse 49. Now watch. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sank into his forehead. (laughs) And he did what upon his face to the earth? Would you say it? Fell. Fell. Look at verse 50. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David, verse 51, ran and stood upon the ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they did what? Look at verse 52. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose. Preacher, I love that. They've been cowering in their tents for 40 days. Teenage boy shows up, takes down the enemy, and the men of Israel get up and they follow probably no more than an 18-year-old boy. The men of Israel and Judah arose, watch the rest of verse 52, and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the, what? Gates of Ekron. Folk, look up at me for a minute. I had the privilege of preaching in the valley of Elah about four years ago. When we left the valley of Elah, I said to our bus driver, who happened to be an Arab man, wonderful guy. I said, I'm just curious. How far is it from the Valley of Elah to the town of Ekron? He said, it's 18 miles. Do you realize under David, a teenage boy's leadership, the army of Israel chased the Philistines 18 miles. Can I hear an amen? 18 miles. Wow. 
Why were they willing to do that? Because David's a man after God's own heart. And men and women with a heart after the heart of God are people with a cause, courage. And this third one, you need to write this down. They're people who command respect. Not demand respect, they command respect. Here is a teenage boy and they respect him so much that they're willing to follow him and pursue an army with a reputation for brutality and chase them eight. Folks, I don't know about you, but I made my choice early on in life. And preacher, all COVID did was drill down deeper in my soul. My wife and I had a prayer meeting. At the very outset of all of this, I may have told you when I was here last, we took our Bible. And by the way, if you've not done this, I would encourage you to do it. It's a great, great thing to do. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 91. Don't do it right now, but there's only 16 verses in it. It begins this way. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He goes on and says this, A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou see and behold the reward of the wicked. In other words, that which is going to be the wicked's plot, it's never going to touch you as a courageous child of God. Can I hear an amen? amen. It also talks about God preserving us from the pestilence. And what my sweet bride and I did is we took that chapter and we prayed all 16 verses as we walked through every inch of our house and said, God, we started this journey by faith and we're going to continue it and end it by faith. Our life is in your hands. But one thing's for sure, we're not going to live this thing called the Christian life in fear. We're going to live it in faith. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Have all of you figured out that we're not going to get out of this world alive? Have you fi- apart from the rapture, we're all going to die of something, right? We're all going to die of something. Preacher, it hit me finally why so many people want to perpetuate this life. It's not that I'm looking to get on the next train either, like you said in Sunday school. I've got a lot to do. I believe God wants me to do. But the fact of the matter is this. This is not all I have. If it is, it's pretty puny, isn't it? See, for the Christian who knows his God, who's been born again by the precious blood of Christ, the best is yet to come. Can I hear an amen? For those who don't have that, the best they've got is right here. Correct? So preacher, I've got to perpetuate it. I've got to push it. I've got to live down here as long as I can because this is all I've got. So you know what? Saving this life is everything. And yet Jesus said, if you save your life, you end up losing it. But if you'll lose your life for my sake in the gospel, that's the life you end up saving eternally. Father, I pray you'd speak to us today. Lord, help us to understand that we have never really been where we are right now in America. Lord, in the founding era of this country, the battle was a little different. It was every bit as real, but it was different. Lord, it took the form of flesh and blood and weapons and musket fire and cannon rounds and the shedding of blood on both sides for America to become a free and independent country. And Lord, right now the battle is not so much physical as it is ideological. But Lord, ideology can morph into a physical battle very, very quickly if people don't do the right thing. And Lord, that which I pray never occurs again in this nation could occur apart from that which we need so desperately and that which only you can send. And Lord, that is a spiritual awakening in our nation, a revival. Lord, this week, Bible Baptist Champaign, Illinois is being called a week of revival. Lord, we've put it on our calendar. 
Lord, even today, one man said, I got off work all week so I could be here. So that means he's planned it into his schedule to be here. Others have done exactly the same. But Lord, help us to understand we're dependent upon a heaven-sent awakening on you. It's not something we can schedule on our calendar. Lord, you have to send it. And so, Father, I'm asking that you would awaken your church. And, Father, send that which we stand in need of. And that's a revival from the very throne room of God. Lord, apart from it, we're in more trouble than we've ever imagined. But with it, the landscape can be eternally altered. Lord, you did it in the 1740s. You did it again in the late 1700s, early 1800s. A first and second great awakening. Lord, here we are. We went all the way through the 1900s and here we are at the year 2021. And we haven't had a third great awakening, but we need one. Father, would you be pleased to rend the heavens and come down and shake the mountains with your mighty presence? Oh God, please. Find people at Bible Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois who are ready and who will get themselves prepared for that which you long to send but that which you cannot send because, Lord, we're not ready. May we get ready today. And, Father, I'll thank you for what you do. Now, friends, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want to ask one question at this point, and I'm as serious as I can be. September of 2020, I was preaching in Union Grove, North Carolina. A man by the name of Charles Jones came to me and said, Dave, are you familiar with the Second Great Awakening? I said, I've read just about everything ever written on it. It was part of my study during my college and seminary training. The first and second great awakening. I said, I'm very familiar. He said, are you aware that three miles from where you're standing is a little church called Moss Chapel? And the second great awakening swept through this community and Moss Chapel was birthed. I said, no, I did not know that. He said, would you like to meet me there tomorrow afternoon? I said, I I would, and I did. Brother Mark, when I drove on the property of that church, that is over 200 years old. I could feel God's presence. I could tell God did something here. God did something here in the year 1800. See, a man by the name of... Sorry. The founder of the Methodist Church the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1800 lived in Olin, North Carolina where Moss Chapel ultimately emerged. That man preached powerfully. He left and went elsewhere. And in 1802, coming up from the south making its way ultimately to Kentucky and over into West Virginia and impacting the entire eastern seaboard of the United States was the second great awakening. That man's name was Francis Asbury, founder of the Methodist Episcopal Church. In those days, the Methodist Church preached the gospel. Asbury was a powerful preacher. Totally unrelated to Francis Asbury, the first pastor of Moss Chapel, was a young man by the name of Daniel Asbury. No relation whatsoever, just shared the same last name. And under that second Asbury's ministry, down by a little creek, the Holy Spirit of God breathed and Moss Chapel was born. What I'm trying to tell you folk is this. Not 40 miles from where I live was a place impacted by the second great awakening. I knew nothing about it. But when you go there, you can sense God did something here. So we held two large prayer meetings inside, outside, put lights outside so people could see. People came from everywhere. 
And we had two large prayer meetings at Moss Chapel in September and October praying for revival in America. Folks, we don't have to go to Moss Chapel, though I wish I could take you there. All we have to do is get into a place, an attitude, a spirit of humility and get right with God. And God will hear our prayer here this morning. So I want to ask you a question. I'm as serious as I can be. How many of you can say, preacher, I'm born again, I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, and I get it. I get it. God used an unlikely suspect in the form of David. But he had a heart after the very heart of God. And all people who have a heart after the heart of God are people with a cause. If you haven't caught it, I'm passionate about my cause. They're people of courage. They don't live in fear. They walk by faith. And number three, they're people who command respect. David commanded the respect of a lost empire, the Philistines, but also the nation of Israel, God's people. And they were willing to follow him. What I'm asking this morning is how many of you understand God's looking for people with a heart after his heart today? And it's on those people when he finds them that he can bestow his blessing. What I'm asking you today is do you want to be a man, a woman, a young person after the heart of God? Do you want to have that kind of heart? Are you willing to say to the Lord today, Lord, I get it. And Lord, if you'll help me, and trust me, God will. I'm going to be a person with a cause, and the cause isn't going to be me and my agenda. I'm going to be a person from this point forward who lives courageously, walking by faith, not by sight. And I want to be a person that commands respect both of lost and saved. God, I want to be a man, a woman, a young person with a heart after your heart. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you just to stand to your feet, if you would, please. Father, would you bless this very brief but vitally important time of invitation? Lord, I pray that right here, what you've been doing across the United States in the last two months, I pray you would do it again right here and raise up additional enlistees into this mighty army of warriors who have a heart after the heart of God, who will wage warfare spiritually. This is a spiritual battle. Father, I pray you would find enlistees here today who'd be willing to say, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm committing to have a heart after your heart like David did. I'm all in today. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do. Folks, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I don't know any other way to word it than this. If you're willing to say, Lord, I'm all in. I'm all in. I want to have a heart after your heart. I want to be what David was in his day. I want to be that in my day. I want to be a man or a woman, young person with a cause, courage, and who commands respect. If that's you, I want to ask you if you'd be willing to do something. Would you be willing to join me here in this altar and tell God that? You can just step out and join me here. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. And God bless you, ladies. God bless you, my dear sir. God bless you, my dear brother. God bless you, couples. Thank God for you. God bless you, young lady. Thank God. For young, God bless you, young man. Nothing stirs my heart like seeing amazing young people. Amazing young people who love Jesus and want to reach their world with the gospel. Thank God for young people. What about you? I want to have a heart, Lord, after your heart. If you don't want to physically kneel, you can just do what some are doing. Just come down here and stand. Come to one of the front seats and sit as others are doing. But with your head bowed, say, God, I want to have a heart after your heart. Folk, this is what it is about for the Christian. We're not just here to take up space and occupy time and inhale and exhale a tremendous gift from God called oxygen. That's not why we're here. We're here to accomplish something. David got it. Nobody else did, but he did. And it changed a nation. One final thing I want to say is these are kneeling here. Friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm going to be standing by that table and those 
large pull-up displays as you exit the room in just a few moments after pastor closes the service. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, I would love nothing more than to take just a few moments to introduce you to the greatest friend you'll ever have. His name is Jesus. He loves you. He died and shed his blood on Calvary's cross for you. He was buried but rose again the third day for you to give you eternal life. If you don't yet know him, let us introduce you to him. Father, would you bless now as Pastor Mark comes. Guide him as you already have so powerfully by your spirit. And Lord, bless these my dear friends who have knelt or are kneeling, standing, sitting around the altar. Father, give us, I pray, the kind of courage, commitment to a cause, and the ability, Lord, as you gave David in your strength to command respect of a lost and saved world. Father, may that be our lot in these strategically important days. And Father, for what you do, we'll thank you, give you glory. In Jesus' name I do pray. And all God's people who prayed with me said, Amen. That was a tremendous message, was it not? And a message that not just people here at Bible Baptist need, but all Christians need that type of, of preaching. And we need to understand something. We can make a difference. I know that it's very easy for us to think, you know, I'm just a little speck of sand on the seashore. I'm a little drop of water in the ocean. But we can make a difference, every single one of us. And there is a cause. We're here to honor and glorify the God of heaven and to be salt and light. I don't need to add to the message. I just wanted to recap what has been said so eloquently today. I needed that message. We needed that message. There will be plenty more preaching of that caliber tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. And I'm going to forego the announcements. I will say that there's some important announcements about Awana and people signing up uh, if you're going to work in the Awana program. We also have some Bible studies that will be starting in August. And I have some promotional videos to show, but I'm not going to do that right now. But you can look at uh, information in your bulletin. Also, there's sign-up sheets on the information desk out in the main lobby. The main thing I want to emphasize as we close today is being back here tonight at 6 o'clock. We need revival. Now, can I just say this? This is, this is pretty frank. But revival's not going to come to your household if you have your feet propped up tonight watching television. It's not. Don't ask God for it. It's not, it's not going to come. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily it's coming if you come down here, but I can guarantee you it's not coming if you have your feet propped up watching television. Okay? Let's take this seriously. I know people work. People are out of town. I get all of that. Providentially hindered. Brother Dave knows that means dead, right? Be here unless you're providentially hindered. Uh, he taught me that years ago now. But seriously, let's be back tonight. One of the best messages I've ever heard in my entire life was last year from Dave Kister on Sunday night. I still remember that message. Boy, it really spoke to my heart. So be back tonight. Pray and ask God to work in your heart this week. Pray and ask God to work in the life of our church. Great service today, amen. God's been honored. That's what it's all about. We're here for him. And let's be back tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Take this seriously. Take it seriously. Well, I've got other things to do. No, you don't. Get down here. Get down here. What else do you have that's more important to do tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday? Well, I've got things I have to do. Get down here. Come on. Putting a little bit of pressure on me. Yes, I am. Come on. Let's get down here. It's not about having warm bodies in the pews. I'm not into all that stuff. I want God to work in your heart. He can't do it if you're not here. So let's come back tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Let's sing the doxology, and we'll be dismissed. Dave Kister will be in the back, standing with my wife and I. Those who are visiting, thank you for coming today. I trust that you've been blessed, and I hope you'll be back. Have I made it clear? I want you to be back tonight. Not sure I've made that clear, but... Anyway, be back tonight, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Night at 6 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Tonight, 6, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Okay? Let's sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Have a great afternoon. See you back tonight. Will all the other not quite? Will all the never get it right? But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. Cause I'm just a nobody trying to tell you.